All right, everybody, how the heck are you doing here? This is from a brother who has a website called ShemaiYishrael.net, and he puts out a um, puts out a newsletter every single week on Shabbat, and it's really good stuff. And this is brother Todd Bennett, and Todd has is an attorney um, in New York City, and he has been doing Torah stuff for a very, 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 very long time. And so he got he got banned last week on YouTube, and he won't be putting back on YouTube. And so he basically said some stuff that went against the guidelines of the health ministers of YouTube. And they decided that it wasn't good for uh, the public to know any of this stuff. And so the health ministers who are protecting us, as they always do, banned him. And so I will be putting this up there. I looked through it. I didn't see anything bannable that they would protect you from the information. So I will try to read this and hopefully you guys can get something out of this because it is about Passover and it is very important. So, and this is a long one, so we'll begin. Dogs are going to bark, kids are probably going to scream. Wife's probably going to smack me over the head. It's going to happen. This is a long reading. Shalom all. Today is day 30 of month 13, also known as April 2nd, 2022 on the Roman calendar. The month of April traces back to the ancient Roman calendar, which originally had only had 10 months. Before January and February were added to the end of the year by King Numa Pompilius around 700 BCE. April was the second month of the Roman calendar year and March was the first. Around 450 BCE, April was rearranged into the fourth position and was assigned 29 days with the introduction of the Gregorian calendar by Pope Gregory the Eighth, or actually the 13th, sorry. Oh no, yeah, this is the 13th. In 1852, in ex well, oh, 15, 1582. An extra day was added. While the existence of the month of April on the calendar is attributed to Rome, the origins of, the, of April trace further back into history. The word April comes from Aprilius, or of Aphrilius, which traces back to Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. This is the same entity as the Roman goddess Venus, and they both derive from the ancient eastern goddess known as Estorth, or Estra, better known today as Easter. They all involve pagan fertility rites, and of course, the obvious time to venerate fertility goddesses is in the spring. All of these pagan fertility goddesses derive from Babylonian sun worship and the pagan trinity of Nimrod, Samaramis, and Tammuz. The name Samaramis comes from Samaramat, which means gift of the sea. Some believe it also means highest of heaven, and they associate her with the queen of heaven, referenced in Jeremiah 7 and 44. According to Diodorus, Samaramis was a hybrid being, being resulting from the union of a mortal man and the fish goddess Derekito of Ashkelon that would make her a Nephilim offspring. According to Alexander Hislop, Samaramis' greatest accomplishment was aiding Nimrod in replacing the worship of Yahuwah with a polytheistic system based on the hosts of heaven, the planets, and the stars. Her son Tammuz was allegedly fathered by the rays of the sun sent down by the deceased Nimrod. Tammuz joined her in creating the world's first mother-son cult. The Samaramis-Tammuz pair inspired Isis and Osiris in Egypt, Venus and Adonis, Adonis in Greece, and Usuras and Vishnu in Hinduism. Today we see this pagan relationship represented in the Christian religion through Mary and Jesus. The Catholics actually venerate Mary as the Queen of Heaven. Of course, of course, Catholics cling to the immaculate conception of both Mary and Jesus, as well as the notion that they both ascended to heaven. Essentially, Mary was not to be outdone by Jesus because she is, after all, the mother of God. This is all mystery Babylon, ancient sun worshipped, repackaged, and renamed. Catholics have fallen into the same error as ancient Israelites who venerated and prayed to the Queen of Heaven. Look at the cult that has developed around apparitions of Mary throughout the centuries. This is so far removed from the plan of Yahuwah contained in the scriptures that it that's what happens to people when they lose their focus and start chasing after miracles. It is critical not to be led astray from what really matters, and that is why I have been focusing on the nations over the past months. The nations play an important role in the culmination of, an, of the end of the age. All of this Babylonian sun worship came about because of the rebellion of man that traces back to Nimrod. The people were divided into nations and languages, but their worship of the hosts of heaven continued in their new tongues. As a result of this religion, Yahuwah chose. Oh, as a result of this rebellion, thanks to Cole. I'm glad I have you there. Yahuwah chose a man from the midst of this Babylonian nonsense and tested his faith. Yahuwah showed him the way and promised great things to his descendants. His obeisance is obedience. Obedience.
it's, yeah, it's hard to read. See. His obedience would lead to the nations being blessed. Yahuwah later made good on those promises and delivered the descendants of Abraham, along with a mixed multitude from bondage in Egypt through the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is what it should say, which occurred in month one of the Creator's calendar. The reason why the month of April was associated with fertility rites is because it is generally aligned with the first month of the creation calendar, sometimes referred to as the month of Aviv. Month one is not named Aviv. It is simply the month of the Aviv, when new life springs forth. The beginning of month one is not determined by barley crops. This is the Karate tradition. Rather, it is determined by the sun and the moon. Genesis 1.14 specifically provides that the two great lights are for signs and seasons and for days and years. I regularly point out that the yearly cycle involves turns, sometimes referred to as seasons. In Hebrew, the word for turn is tek tekufa, and they include the cycles of the sun categorized as the solstices and the equinoxes. These turns are built into creation by the creator himself. The pagans recognize the significance of these turns, as does anyone whose life is connected with the land and growing crops. Modern Babylonian life and religion are not very connected with creation. That is why it is so easy for Western cultures to simply follow a man-made calendar that is placed before them. It doesn't really matter to them how many days are in a month or how time is calculated. They do not plan and rehearse the yearly cycle like the ones who wrote the Gezer calendar. When Moshe and Aaron were in Egypt, Yahuwah told them, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Exodus 12.2 The word for month is Chodesh, which literally means renewal. We know that the month referred to in this passage was the month of Aviv, when new life springs forth. And the month of Aviv is determined through the turn, Tekuwa, of the spring equinox. For a more detailed discussion on determining the beginning of the year, I suggest that you check out the Walk in the Light series book at titled Appointed Times, as well as the article of Determining the Hebrew Year on the Torah Calendar website. And Todd has excellent books, and he gives a tremendous amount of his books away, but he has been doing books since the beginning, long, long, long time. Uh, he, he's, I don't know, probably in his 60s, I would say. Um, and so he's been keeping Torah for a very long time. And so um, all those books are on the site. You know, obviously don't buy them on Shabbat. But if you know of people that are looking for the way, the starting the way, he has a great um, series. And he actually gives away a free book called A Walk in the Light series, um, which I, I know that he would give to anybody who, who wanted it. So the sun and the moon help guide us through the passage of years. And that is exactly what will be happening this evening after sunset. After the sun sets, a remnant of people all around the world who are in covenant relationship with Yahuwah and actually believe his word will be looking up to sight the first sliver of the renewed moon. Interestingly, tonight they will be joined by a massive number of Muslims from all around the world who are also looking for a renewed moon in order to determine the beginning of Ramadan. There are already numerous reports of sightings from the Middle East. As happens every year, I am receiving conflict and reports from barley inspection teams and the like who attempt to assert control over Yahuwah's calendar based upon a crop of grain. Make no mistake about it, the enemy sows seeds of confusion, especially regarding the calendar, because he wants to confuse and divide the people of Elohim. Those who choose to subject themselves to Kareiti traditions and follow witnesses who deny Yahushua will remain in confusion by their own accord. It doesn't matter if these people send a report from Jerusalem at this point. Since today is day 30 of month 13, there is no 31-day scriptural month. So tomorrow is day 1 of month 1 by default. This has to be so because we know the ordinances of the sun and the moon. The fact that the sun and moon continue in their predicted cycles is actually a confirmation that Yahuwah will keep his promise to restore his covenant people. Remember the promise of the renewal in Jeremiah? Take a moment and read the extended portion. 31. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahuwah, when I will make a renewed covenant with the house of Yisrael and with the house of Yahuda. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says Yahuwah. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Yisrael after those days, says Yahuwah. I will put my Torah in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. What a promise. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Yahuwah, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says Yahuwah. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Thus says Yahuwah, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the seas and his waves roar. Yahuwah of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, says Yahuwah, then the seed of Yisrael shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Jeremiah 31, 31, 36. 
I know that I quote a portion of this text a lot, but did you notice the emphasis on identifying Yahuwah with the forces of creation? Did you read that Yahuwah of hosts is his name? Over the past several months, we have heard rumblings in the archaeological world about an artifact found on Mount Ebal, possibly containing the oldest inscription of the name of Yahuwah. One headline read, 3,000-year-old tablet with God's name affirms biblical timeline. It's not as though we needed this tablet to affirm the scriptures. We did not. It is always wonderful to find an ancient artifact that strengthens and supports the scriptural account of history. What I am wondering is whether Christians from around the world will now get the revelation that Elohim has a name, and it's not the Lord. I wonder if they will actually start using his name, exalting his name, and praising his name as the scriptures command. The real question is whether they even care about his name. Well, they had better start caring before it's too late. We have been talking about the many who are going to be weeping and gnashing their teeth because they thought they had a relationship with Yahushua. To their shock and dismay, he tells them to depart from him because he never knew them. On a very basic level of understanding, you definitely need to know someone's name if you are going to claim to know them. How can you claim to know and serve the father and his son if you don't know their names? There is a riddle in the Proverbs regarding the names and it goes as follows. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name if you know? Proverbs 3, 4. Part of the riddle was answered through the passage that we just read in Jeremiah. Yahuwah of hosts is his name. The other part was answered through the Hebrew and Aramaic text of the Brit Hadasha, not the Greek and English translations that most of us have been steeped in. The son carries the name of the father. His name is Yahusha, which means Yahuwah saves. Of course, that is what we hope for. We want Yahuwah to save his people, those in covenant with him. That is what the promise confirmed again through Jeremiah. 14. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahuwah, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Yisrael and to the house of Yahuda. Guys, notice there's no house of Gentile anywhere. If you guys consider yourselves Gentiles, uh, Hasatan is, is uh, cheering because that's what he wants. He, Hasatan has the house of Gentiles. In those days, and at that time, I will cause to grow up it to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Yahuda will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called, Yahuwah, our righteousness. For thus says Yahuwah, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me, to kindle grain offerings and to sacrifice continually. And the word of Yahuwah came to Jeremiah saying, Thus says Yahuwah, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that there will not be day and night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with Dawid, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and, the, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the descendants of Dawid, my servant and the Levites who minister to me. Dogs are talking. Moreover, the word of Yahuwah came to Jeremiah saying, have you not considered what these people have spoken saying? The two families which Yahuwah has chosen, he has also cast them off. Thus they have despised my people as if they should no more be a nation before them. Thus says Yahuwah, if my covenant is not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, so that I will not take any of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. For I will cause their captives to return and will have mercy on them. Jeremiah 33, 14 through 26. Here again, we see the promise of the covenant tied with time and the markers of time. As we continue to observe night and day and the ordinances of the moon, we anticipate the promises of Yahuwah. We can rely on the sun rising and setting as well as the moon continuing from renewal to renewal. As a result of this, we can be assured that Yahuwah will keep his promise concerning his covenant. In fact, the renewal of the moon is a reminder of the renewal of the covenant. As we look to see new visible light being reflected from the sun, we understand that it is not a new or different moon from the one that has pa that passed. It is the same moon that has simply come out of the darkness. It is resurrected, if you will, from the shadow of death and brought forth into the light of the sun. What amazing imagery built into the ordinances of heaven. As we rehearse these events, we're reminded of the promises that have been fulfilled, as well as the promises to come. Indeed, we know that Yahushua came as promised, and renewed the covenant with Yisrael, not with the Christian church. That is why he had 12 disciples with him when he 
renewed the covenant. Those 12 disciples represented Kal Yisrael, all of Yisrael, all 12 tribes. As we approach month one, those who are in covenant renewed by the blood of Yahushua anticipate celebrating and remembering that event at Passover. One of the major eye-opening events in my walk was when I realized that the Last Supper was not some random meal Yahushua was eating before his crucifixion, nor was it a mock Passover meal that occurred the day before the actual Passover. No, it was a Passover meal that occurred right at the beginning of day 14 after sunset following day 13. It continued into the night until they later went to the Mount Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. The word Gethsemane is actually very interesting. It consists of two words, gat, which means press, and shaman, which can mean eight or, fa on, or fatness. It is typically described as an olive press, but the connection with the number eight is truly fascinating, considering what he was accomplishing while being pressed. Through the years, I conducted a couple of Passover tours in the Covenant land. During one of them, the timing was such that I had an opportunity to bring my group up to the traditional location of Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritan community is located. While the Samaritans keep a hybrid form of Torah faith, there are some interesting things we can glean from their customs, such as the Paleo-Hebrew Torah scrolls that they maintain. They also still conduct the Passover as a community, and it is amazing to observe how they slaughter their lambs right at sunset and then quickly prepare them between the evens. The lambs are then placed on a stake and lowered into burning pits. The symbology of what happened to Yahushua is amazing, and they don't even recognize that he fulfilled the pattern as the Lamb of Elohim. I'll get into the specific timing of Passover meal next week because I think it's critical to understand if you were a day late in Egypt, it was a matter of life and death. Many people have fallen into error because they have adopted Pharisaic traditions concerning the observance of the Passover. One of the biggest points of confusion involves the interpretation of the Hebrew phrase between the evenings. The Pharisees have literally destroyed the Torah through their tradition, leading many people to observe the Passover a day late. I published an article titled Between the Evenings Explained that I strongly encourage you to read in order to straighten out any confusion. We need to get this right during rehearsals. It is during the rehearsal phase when you correct the mistakes before opening night. This is literally true with a Passover rehearsal. If you have been following the last several messages, I hope it is clear that you need to be in a covenant relationship with Yahuwah if you want to come out of the nations and be classified as His people. His people are anticipating Passover while many other people claiming to be His people are anticipating Easter. Well, as you say, the proof's in the pudding. You demonstrate your relationship by what you say and what you do. If you worship Jesus or Isis, a child of Zeus, that's a problem. If you observe a fertility rite on Easter Sunday in accordance with Babylon sun worship, that's a problem as well. Yahuwah is looking for a people who will be holy, set apart, as he is holy, set apart. A set apart people do not mix the worship of Yahuwah with Babylon fertility rites. That is an abomination. We must separate from the Babylonian traditions and lies that we have inherited from our fathers and step out from underneath that curse. O Yahuwah, verse 19, my strength and my fortress is my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentile nations, Gentiles, shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness, and unprofitable things. Will a man make gods for himself which are not gods? Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Yahuwah. Jeremiah 16, 19 to 21. There's that name again. This passage is describing a prophetic event that we are currently in the midst of. The Gentiles, the nations, are waking up to the traditions and lies that they have inherited through the religions of their fathers. As people from the nations learn the name and all that it entails, they can truly leave Babylon and come to know him. It may mean a break from traditions that are near and dear to your heart, including your Easter ham dinner. It may mean breaking fellowship with others who refuse to walk the narrow way that leads to life. So what? I would rather be friends with Yahushua than friends with the world. Yahushua said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. John 15, 12 through 14. He also said, if you love me, keep my commands, John 14, 15. The Passover is a commandment. Easter is not. It's an abomination. Logically, if you are a friend of Yahushua and you love him, then you will be obeying the commandments. The Passover involved the lamb, the blood of the lamb, providing the protection for the firstborn of every household that was covered. It reveals the pattern of the firstborn in the role of redemption and deliverance. 
Eastern traditions derived from fertility rites that involved the priests of Easter copulating with the virgins on the altar of Easter during Easter sunrise services. Wow, it's quite the morning. They would sacrifice the infants born from the rituals of the previous year and then dip red e eggs red in the blood of those slaughtered babies. Wow. The blood of those innocents was an offering to the goddess Easter for an abundant crop, Istar. Check out a brief video on Easter that I filmed in Jerusalem at a pagan ritual site. Todd, why are you at a pagan ritual site? Now, he, he goes there and he, 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 uh, he takes a look at everything. He is extremely experienced in the land of Yisrael. Okay. Of course, it is, is it any wonder that the Christian nation that celebrates Easter also slaughters millions of unborn and newborn babies? It is the bloodlust of the fertility goddess being empowered by the people who knowingly or inadvertently worship her. So who do you love and what blood will you be celebrating this year? You will demonstrate your heart through your actions. Oh, sure, I hear it all the time. Well, that's not what it means to me. Guess what? It doesn't matter what it means to you. It matters what it means to Yahuwah. He specifically commands us not to worship him like the nations worship their gods. I can assure you that if you are participating in a fertility rite named after a fertility goddess, goddess and then ignoring his commanded appointed time of Passover, your actions are not pleasing in his eyes. This is the problem with the many who will be sent into outer darkness where, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They think that what they're doing is right, but they are mistaken. Instead of diligent obedience, they are worshiping the way that they learned or in a way that they are comfortable with. They think that they can define their relationship with Yahuwah through their own religious construct. And, and I'm going to break on that and say, that's what everyone says. You know my heart, right? And so oh, God knows my heart. Indeed, he does. The Passover is the entry into the covenant path that begins with a focus on the firstborn. It leads us from redemption, deliverance, and gathers us for a wedding. The annual cycle of the appointed times provides a path of restoration back into a relationship with Yahuwah and back into Eden paradise it is a roadmap provided by yahuwah for his people to follow it guides us home passover day 14 followed by the feast of unleavened bread days 15 through 21 is an eight day celebration that begins the cycle of the appointed times that cycle ends with another eight day celebration in month seven starting with sukkot days days 15 through 21 and ending with shemi at, at Terzet, specifically called the eighth day day 22 I hope you can see the pattern, how these times book in the harvest cycle from the grain to the fruit. It is the reverse of the fall. Man was originally placed in the garden to watch and tend it. Yahuwah planted the garden and did all the initial work. Man was literally able to reap the fruits of Elohim's labor. Only after the fall was man required to labor for grain every year. His life would now be consumed with obtaining food because he rebelled and consumed the forbidden fruit. Here's the curse rendered upon the man. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Imagine that! The ground was cursed because of man's disobedience, so mankind and the entire planet must be restored. And yes, I agree. From, from a farmer's perspective, the ground is cursed. The appointed times reveal the plan of Yahuwah to reverse the curse, and it all accumulates on the eighth day when we can leave our temporary dwellings. It is, it is an... And then he stops there. I think he missed the rest of it, what he's saying. Um, I don't even know what he was saying, so I can't even help him there. Some days in the future, this will involve the return to paradise that we read about in Revelation. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Elohim, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, Revelation 21, 1 and 2. And he showed me a, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of Elohim, and the, of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits. Each tree yielded its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of Elohim, the Lamb, shall be in it, and his servants shall, shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. there they, 
need no lamp for nor light of the sun for Yahuwah Elohim gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 22, 1 through 5. This is the promise that awaits his people. Of course, those in the covenant are supposed to be circumcising their male children on the eighth day. The number eight represents new beginnings and that is exactly what the covenant journey through the appointed times provides. Restoration and the new beginnings for those in covenant renewed by the blood of Yahushua. The text or revelation describes a renewal of creation, not a brand new creation. With that understanding, we should all be filled with excitement and anticipation at the renewed cycle of appointed times, including the patterns and rehearsals contained therein. It all begins tonight as we mark the beginning of a new month, month one of a new year. So everybody needs to blow their shofars tonight. It is important that we endeavor upon this path with a full understanding of where it leads. These are not just a bunch of Jewish holidays that are old and outdated. In fact, the Jews attempt to keep these times through their traditions without an understanding of how Yahush fulfilled some of them and will continue to fulfill them in the future. And to that regard right there, the Jews will actually not take a lamb on Passover. We had this uh, Jewish rabbi, and he, his, his name was obviously Yaakov. Um, and he told us, yeah, we're supposed to eat chicken because we uh, we shouldn't eat lamb because that's uh, that's what everyone else does. And we so, don't want our neighbors to know what we're doing. Yeah, we don't, you don't want your neighbors to know what you're doing or something. Some funky thing of that sort. So, yeah, they eat chicken instead of lamb, and it doesn't say chicken. Um in fact, the Jews attempt to keep those times, understand and fulfill them in the future. He said, do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And that does not mean end. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle by, will by no means pass from the Torah till all is fulfilled. My friends, heaven and earth must be destroyed before the Torah is gone. We're still here. I still look out. I see the sky. I see, the, I see everything outside. It's still here. Once again. The covenant is tied with creation, and Yahushua was specifically referring to the fact that he was fulfilling those promises, although through the appointed times. Nothing would pass until all was fulfilled and all had not yet been fulfilled. We still await his, his return to finish the work. He clearly did not come to abolish the appointed times. He was fulfilling the prophetic patterns and filling them up with meaning. He continues to operate within the framework of the appointed times. The religious Jews generally reject Yahushua as the Messiah. In fact, their Talmud says even more evil things. As a result, they are celebrating their holidays in the dark. That is why Yahuwah declared through Amos, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Amos 5.21 So, we do not follow the Jewish calendar and their traditions concerning the appointed times. Instead, we look to the way, the truth, and the life, John 14.6, our friend, who laid down his life for us and shed his blood to renew the covenant on Passover. Will you be his friend and disciple and follow him on this exciting covenant journey that leads to the Father of, and life? If so, it's time to sound that shofar, mark the time, and start counting down to the Passover. Baraka to you all. Rosh Chadosh Tov. Good renewed month and Rosh Hashanah Tov. Good head of the year. And I'm sure I slaughtered that. So there's a website right there, guys. Um, uh, Shema Yisrael.net. You can go and sign up for this newsletter. I strongly suggest you guys do this. Todd is one of the very, very, very few people. In fact, he's probably the only one that I know. I actually know two. Two people. Um, Todd is one, and I believe Dr. Stephen Pigeon is the other one, um, who are Torah keepers who keep with everything that is correct. I do not believe the other Torah keepers are on track. I do not believe that they have their deities correct and have figured this stuff all out. Todd definitely has. So... Um, he says, I have prepared a chart of the upcoming appointed times that you can download from the website, Shema, Shema Yisrael, Shema, S-H-E-M-A, Y-I-S-R-A-E-L.net, um, and click on that where it says appointed times, and he has some really good stuff there. That is the same calendar. He uses the same calendar we use, um, same Shabbats we use, same new moons as he uses, and so, um, guys, I hope this does something for somebody out there i know this is not going to make it to youtube this will make it to my youtube channel but it will not make it to todd's um unfortunately because you know the uh forces of evil are among us so passover is very important it is something that it seems it's going to seem weird to begin with it seemed really weird to us the first year that we dressed up put our sandals on and got our staff um ate our food in haste with bitter herbs and things of that nature it was it was odd it was very weird it was like we're in a play or something of the sort and we felt a little silly doing it and we'll probably still feel a little silly <laughs> But at the end of the day, those are my bad dogs. At the end of the day, this is a commandment, right? This is a in memory of, and when our Messiah, Yahushua, came, that became our Passover lamb. That became um, 
that became everything. And so here we are. We need to keep this and we need to keep preparing for this stuff. So guys, um, Sabbath is just about over for us here. We got in about another hour here. I hope this helps somebody and much love. Take